Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Veterans in Politics International, and we are conducting our uh, endorsement interview for State Senate District Number 18. We have Ronald Ron uh, Billadu. Uh, first off, we want to thank you very much for uh, coming in. Uh, Ron is running for State Senate District Number 18. So Ron, the first thing uh, I would like to do is thank you very much for coming in and being a part of this endorsement uh, interview process. Uh, now what I'd like you to do, and uh, I'd give you up to five minutes to just introduce yourself, just give a quick background about yourself and why exactly are you running? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to the interview today. Uh, it's good to be here, um, talking to the panel. Uh, try, uh, you know, I'm um, not a position-oriented candidate, right? I'm, I'm running based on my skill sets and capabilities. Um, my belief that as a representative, I represent the, uh, the people that have elected me, and uh, that you know, I'm, I'm better off going in uh, with an open mind, uh, identifying what the issues are, the people, what, what the concerns are to the constituents, and working through it that way. I, wanna, I know what I know, I know what I don't know, and, uh, and that's how I, I approach um, all my interactions and all, everything that I do. So uh, my, my history, I uh, grew up in the, in the East Coast, uh, joined the Marine Corps right out of high school, served four years in the Marine Corps. I uh, got out of the Marine Corps, um, uh, loved the Corps, everybody hurrah. Got out of the Marine Corps and um, became a cable TV installer. So I got to travel across the great nation, meeting a lot of people, building cable TV systems. So I was an installer, worked my way up into the construction. It's kind of like having a fire team, right? Being part of a fire team, a five-man fire team. It was a five-man line crew. We were out there building cable TV systems. And uh, it was a great time, get to see the country. I finally settled down in uh, California, uh, got married in California, moved to Nevada in uh, 1996, and I've uh, been active in the community in Nevada. I have three children, I've been married to my wife for 32 years, and um, I worked for the power company for 20 years, uh, retired from Envy Energy in July of last year. I work as a consultant in the electric industry right now for infrastructure, poles, conduit right away, that type of thing. And I'm involved in uh, some broadband technology deployments as a consultant. Um, I decided to run for office. Uh, one, uh, you know, I've always been involved in the community. Uh, I was a um, youth sports coach for a good 10 years. I was president of my homeowners association for eight years when we first moved into town. And I'm on the board of directors of the YMCA, and I believe that you know our duty as uh, as individuals, as productive individuals, uh, mem the working members of society, is to uh, you know to nurture the youth, educate the youth in, in everything, not just educate them in uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but to educate them in societal norms and civics and, and that type of thing. Uh, I think that's a, 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 a discipline. Uh, respect for authority. I think that's a big part of raising a child, and I think uh, as individuals, that that should be our focus. In addition to that, I think that um, you know my focus is to um, make sure that those who um, don't have the same resources or capabilities that I have are taken care of, uh, whether that's uh, veterans or or the elderly. Um, or, or anyone who, who needs help in society, I, I truly believe that, uh, that our mission as uh, individuals in a uh, democratic republic uh, is to participate in the process and take care of those individuals around us who need our assistance. I decided to run because I have the opportunity to run. I've always wanted to uh, be involved at this level. I think I um, actually have the, uh, the best um, uh, potential for uh, for winning in the general election, so I uh, chose to run against the uh, Democratic, um, uh, the other Democrat in the primaries, and I think I have the the best chance to defeat the uh, the Republican in the in the general election. So, okay, well, thank you very much for that. Um, in your introduction, you brought up uh, issues and concerns in your district, um, as you've done research prior to deciding to run for this particular uh, district. What are the uh, top three issues and concerns 
that have been expressed to you by uh, your potential constituents? In my district, uh, regarding just the district, overall concerns, veterans' concerns, if you could clarify. The top three uh, concerns. Okay, very district. good. It doesn't matter well, whether it's veterans' concerns or just top three that, well, that you've heard. The environment's very fluid right now, right? Those concerns are changing. Uh, you know, if you asked me a month ago, I probably would have said that uh, you know, water was, was the number one issue. We have a lot of uh, farm properties up in that area. There's, uh, um, you know, there's a concern about uh, you know, water in the Las Vegas Valley Water District. Uh, I think energy efficiency, uh, renewable energy, re reducing carbon emissions, that's a big concern on a national basis and concern to everyone in, in America and, and uh, in, my, in my district. Um, the third concern, uh, you know, uh, access to uh, nutrition right now, it's access to nutrition and, and uh, adapting to uh, these new uh, technical requirements for um, you know, online learning and all of that. So I think the concerns are fluid, they're changing every day. Uh, and when, when, when you talk about, um, you know, speaking with my constituents, I, you know, I'll be completely honest. I, I just announced my, I haven't even announced my election for this, uh, this office, right? I, I went and registered and, and uh, threw my hat in the ring, and I believe I have a very good um, understanding of the community, but I don't know all the issues. And, and you know, as state senator, um, that's, that's my job as state senator, is to get to know those issues, to collaborate with to, to communicate with the constituents, to collaborate with my colleagues. Um, I said earlier, I'm not a position-oriented candidate. I, I'm, I'm running based on my capabilities, my skill sets, my skill sets as an operations manager, my skill sets as a uh, project manager, my skill sets uh, as a uh, member of the YMCA board of directors and, and being involved in the community, understanding the needs of that part of the community. And uh, that's why I'm running, not, not because I know all the answers, because, uh, you know, I don't. I'm going to be dependent when I'm elected on, uh, on this group to tell me what the veterans issues are, what, what should be prioritized. So I um, hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. Um, another thing, just so that the um, listeners and viewers are aware, so with all these um, different races, uh, when you say State Senate District 18, for the viewers and listeners, what, what exactly is that? What, what are the boundaries? And then also, the um, second part of my question is, what exactly is your role as a state senator? Oh, very good. Um, the district is two assembly districts. Uh, the western boundary is out near Sumlin around the 215. Uh, the eastern boundary is Decatur, Decatur Boulevard, um, all up to the north to Centennial, Centennial Boulevard, and, uh, and south to Lake Mead. It, it kind of has a, a kind of a dog leg in it that, that drops down um, in, towards Lake Mead. Cheyenne is probably the cutoff up on the eastern region of it. Uh, and that, that's the district. It includes Floyd Lamb State Park, uh, includes uh, a lot of churches, a lot of ball fields. Um, it's, uh, it's a very vibrant part of the, the community, uh, a few golf courses in there, Aliante Casino, Aliante Casino is outside of it, but the Santa Fe Casino is within the district. Um, a lot of shopping centers. Uh, when I moved in there, it was uh, I was in a little tiny community. It was nothing but desert north of me. And I, I've had the, as an infrastructure guy, I've had the privilege to see uh, a whole community of, uh, you know, 50, 6, 100,000 people uh, be developed around me as well as the infrastructure to support that community. And I think they did a very good job at it. I just want to keep that going. And um, uh, my you know, my philosophy is continuous improvement. Uh, you know, I'm not here to shake the tree. Uh, well, maybe shake the tree a little bit, right? But I'm not here to uh, change everything, make dramatic changes immediately. I think that, uh, you know, we have to build on our successes, uh, learn uh, from our challenges and failures, and, uh, and continuous improvement is, is the way that, uh, that we all become more successful. Uh, and my role as state senator, I think I mentioned it earlier, is to represent the people who elected me. It's, it's not to come in with my own positions. I have my own opinions and I have my own ideas, my own moral base, my own ethics and, and things that I've developed through my socialization and, and, and the things that I've done over the years. Um, 
I live a disciplined lifestyle, and uh, I, I believe that as state senator, my goal is to represent the interests of the people that elect me. It's not to uh, profess my my beliefs uh, and and try to uh, to forward my initiatives in politics or my initiatives in government. It's to represent the people who elect me, and to to uh, to use my skill sets and capabilities to to collaborate with my colleagues in the assembly and and at, at the state to come up with the best solutions that are in the best interest of the community. How you doing, sir? I got uh, two Pretty quick good. questions for you. Okay. One is quicker than the other. So you said that you're, you know what you know and you know what you don't know. And mm -hmm. you're here to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. So usually Democrats vote a certain way, Republicans vote a certain way. On key issues, we all know it, it causes issues. Mm -hmm. If your people in your district told you that they wanted a vote on a specific bill or item that was completely against your party's toe line, would you step over that and follow the people's word over your party's word? I would. I would try to forward the interests of the people, and I would collaborate. And when I say step over, I would want to work both sides of the aisle. My my goal. Uh, is to be a collaborative uh, person, to, to work uh, like a project manager would work, like an operations manager would work. Uh, I have an MBA, I understand how things work. And uh, I'm also a communications major. My major in college was communications. I would use all of the skill sets that I've developed over the years to communicate effectively across party lines and try to develop the best policy um, in the interest of those people that, that are trying to promote their, their interests. Okay, with that being said, you are you are a UNLV alum, correct? I am. Okay, so if I told you that you could bring student loans down, the cost of college, the cost that it takes on the taxpayers, the schools themselves, all the entities involved in college, you can almost make students graduate a year to a year and a half earlier if you took out unnecessary courses that did not pertain to the degree that the student was trying to obtain would you be open to doing something like that, like shortening school to two and a half years for a specific degree as long as the student passed all the curriculum in that degree? Well, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb, Mr. Switzer, and say that I believe that uh, one of the commitments that, um, that all Americans should have to our community is community service. So if I was in favor, if there was any way that that we, we would shorten. I believe that, that college is more, and you, the universe is more than just a reading, writing, and arithmetic education. I believe that it's, it's more of a holistic experience that, um, that uh, socializes people to cultural norms, to, to interactions with other people, how to collaborate with, with other students and the professors, to respect the, the authority of the, um, of the, the system. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to tell you real quick if I have time, and I believe I do. You know, I've been a, uh, a high school sports official, a football official for the past 20 years. And uh, some of the things I see on the, on the, the football field in youth football and, and in high school football is appalling to me. I believe that, um, that the children are not, uh, the, 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 the people, the, the kids participating in youth sports are not being taught respect for authority at a very young age. And I think that that, uh, that perpetuates to not being uh, respectful to the educational process and their teachers and then further on uh, to law enforcement. So I believe that we need to start right back there and, and start to educate our, our children back there. So back to the, the question that you asked, and, and to be more succinct on it, I would, I, after careful research and identifying what courses that, that someone would propose to cut, I would hope there wouldn't be any civic courses where we get an understanding of our, um, of our government and, and, and the way the government operates and, and, and history courses. Um, my, my belief is that, uh, that, like I said, it's a holistic experience. I don't know what courses are being proposed to be cut. Um, but I believe that, that a full education is necessary. So whether it's two and a half years in, in, um, in, in the university and two years in the Peace Corps or in the, the Marine Corps or the Army, I think everyone needs four years of education of some sort into the way America operates. And uh, I truly believe that uh, every, every one of our students should be um, engaged in some kind of uh, civic activity or community activity as well as the university. So if, if you're going two and a half years at the university, please be prepared to spend a year and a half on the, on the uh, Peace Corps. And when you do that two and a half years, 
please be prepared to step up and join the military and, and you know, contribute to the safety and security of our nation. I was more or less talking about classes that are unnecessary to a degree. So if you have a business degree, if you're going mm -hmm. there for a business degree, why would you need to study lesbian dance theory? Why would that be a requirement? That's what I'm saying. Courses like that that aren't necessarily yeah. pertain directly to your degree of the field you're going to partake in, mm -hmm. take those off the student's requirement because the teachers are writing the syllabuses, the teachers are writing the books, they're telling the students they got to buy their book for this class. It's completely unnecessary. Yeah, I, you know, I, I graduated later on in life, right? I went to night school. Um, I was a lineman for years. And when I uh, went to work for the power company, they said, hey, we, we like you. You look like uh, you, know, you know your stuff. You have a, you know, good communication skills, uh, but you need a college degree. And we'll, we'll send you to school. So I went to school nights. And, um, and you know, there, I had to search for classes. And I, I took classes that, um, that I probably wouldn't have taken. Um, but they were the only classes available in that category that was necessary. So further to your question, Mr. Switzer, um, those elective classes, uh, there should be a certain number of elective classes to, to better um, socialize people into, into America. Uh, and I believe that the students should have the choices on, the, on which classes to take. I should believe there should be more availability of courses and more, um, uh, you know, increase the, the options for students to take those classes so that you don't have to take a class that doesn't make sense to where you're going. As a communications major, I minored in business management. Um, I took a lot of business classes, uh, you know, and I took uh, some classes in communications in theory that, that uh, did not relate to where I planned on going with my degree. Uh, which is sitting right in, here in front of you, you fine gentlemen. Uh, so, you know, uh, I would like to carefully study that and see if there's, um, if there's anything, anything you can do to pare down the budget and make school more affordable for students and accelerate their, um, their skilled deployment into the workforce. I think that'd be great to, to review and, and consider. Okay, so my question is, um, you talked about respect earlier for uh, uh, police officers. Um, what about respect for our, our citizens? Um, and do you believe that the police should have to respect our citizens when they get pulled over? Oh, I do. Uh, very much so. I, um, I spent 10 years in, in uh, Los Angeles building uh, cable TV systems and fiber optic systems. Uh, a lot of my work was done through South Central Los Angeles. A lot of it was done through Compton in that area. Um, I saw a lot of things going on there that I considered inappropriate. Um, and uh, I believe that, uh, that law enforcement serves uh, at the um, you know, request of the people and that, uh, that they need to respect the, the citizens as well. If an officer stops a person for, for whatever the violation is, they, sh they should approach that person respectfully. Um, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not an angel. I've got a speeding ticket. You know, I had an officer walk up to the back of my car and tap on my car with a club. You know, rather, rather, and I was with my son and two, two boys, you know, son and a couple of his friends taking them somewhere. And uh, I didn't think that was respectful. It's my car. You know, you can walk up to my door and, and uh, you know, talk to me respectfully, uh, ask me to please hand my license over. Not everyone's a criminal. And um, I think that, uh, you know, training is needed in, in how the, the police uh, and uh, all, all government officials should, should act with, with, um, with the citizens. Now, it's a two-way street, though. You know, if uh, someone gets stopped they, and, you know, they, they need to, to respect the authority of that police officer and follow the directives of that police officer. Yeah, no, definitely. So I, I also believe everybody needs to respect each other. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess my next question is um, a lot of times, you know, people are getting pulled over and uh, let's say if the police officer does something wrong, they don't turn over the body cam for years um, or the, they simply act like they don't have it. Uh, would you support a law that would make that require the law to, you know, if it's the district attorney or the police officers themselves to turn over that video within 24 hours, 48 hours, no matter what's on that video? Would I support a law? Um, you know, a lot of laws come with uh, other things tagged on to them. I would have to, you know, understand the specifics of the law and, and definitely the reasoning for that law. And I, and I would have to, um, 
do some research on the frequency of not not complying with, with turning over the video and, and see see what what the magnitude of that is before I can commit to um, to supporting a law uh, in in general terms. Uh, yes, I, I believe that that's public information. Uh, I believe that um, you know a a open disclosure, a free and open society is necessary. And um, you know, I would support anything that that uh, contributes to that. Okay, and would you support an application or you know a video recording, um, a, a citizen video recording a police officer? Uh, when they were to get pulled over to make sure you know that everybody um, is not breaking the law and they wouldn't have to worry about the police officer turning over the body cam um, and, and are you are you uh, talking about a um, like a private network or, or just the, the no, individual sir, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about any citizen that were to get pulled over I'm asking if there was an application or even simply would you support um, basically a law that requires uh, uh, any citizen to be able to record a police officer if they were to get pulled over well you know I think in today's society um, almost everything we do is recorded anywhere anyways uh, you know if you get stopped in, in any urban environment uh, there's a lot of cameras out there the traffic signals have cameras there's cameras uh, ring doorbells on everybody's home um, I think a lot of that is captured anyways I, I don't want to um, create laws which which um, uh, put an additional requirement on people who may not be able to afford it if that's what you're talking about but no you're not talking about that okay uh, you, you, so the application uh, I'm not sure where the application would be initiated from from the phone and is it I don't know uh, you tell me is it illegal for someone to record the the interaction with the police officer now well you know what it, it's not that it's illegal I would record it. So it's not that it's illegal, but a lot of times, you know, officers say, hey, turn off that camera. So what I'm saying is if nobody's hiding anything, everybody should be able to record. So what I'm asking is, do you think that it's fair that everyone's allowed to record? And do you think that it's fair that officers tell people to turn off their camera? Uh, no, I, uh, this is a free and open society. People, if we record things, people should be able to record uh, any event that's happening as long as it's lawful Great. okay two well two quick questions then since it is a free and open society and should be free and open would you support a constitutional ccw course that the person could take once they take it's approved they've passed the class they prove that they know the laws and how to handle a firearm that they're allowed to carry in any state just like they could drive in any state with a basic driver's license yeah, so um, the, listen, I'm a firm believer in the Second Amendment, okay? I, you know, um, well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to bear, bear arms should not, bear, keep and bear arms should not be infringed. I'm also in favor with the extension of that to include uh, not being in, in a militia, right? That was a policy which, which uh, kind of defined that, that uh, Second Amendment a little more. I'm in favor of Nevada's laws uh, regarding um, uh, the Second Amendment and that uh, you know anyone should be able to possess a weapon for uh, legal reasons, including hunting and, and sports, uh, sports activities. Um, concealed weapons, uh, I believe that yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard call because I, I don't know, uh, you know what the I know what the state the, the, I, I could know what the state uh, I don't carry a weapon, right I don't believe that I need to carry a weapon. Uh, some people do believe that. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, my life and, and uh, I believe I can handle myself. I can either um, defuse the situation. I've been trained to defuse situations. Um, and uh, I put, you know, my, my life in the hands of Almighty God. And uh, so I don't carry a weapon. But if people believe that they should carry a weapon, you know, everybody should have the same equal rights to carry that weapon wherever they are. If someone believes they need to carry a concealed weapon um, and they receive certification and the certification is the same in every everywhere they go um, and it's the most stringent certification and yeah, yeah sure it should be um, inter interactive or interchangeable between states uh, as long as it's stringent and it's it's approved by all the states that um, that uh, that 
put you know put together that those uh, certification processes. But I wouldn't want someone to come into the state of Nevada where we have certain regulations from another state that uh, you know allows people to you know take a five question test and and uh, all of a sudden they can you know pack and carry and, and conceal a weapon. I don't like that answer. All right, so with everything that's going on, our economy is going to need to bounce back, especially Nevada. Nevada people are hurting. A lot of people are employed by hotels and casinos, and they're just not working right now. Some some hotels and casinos are doing their thing and paying them. Would you be open to using a lot of the unused land in the state of Nevada for something like uh, solar panel farms, and we can sell our energy to other states and bring it back down into here to make our residents' energy costs go down? So I have a, um, a graduate certificate in renewable energy uh, from the uh, uh, University of Reno College of Engineering. I was a 16 credit course. Uh, I'm a firm believer in renewable energy. I, I think that the uh, that Envy Energy, I retired from Envy, Envy Energy after 20 years. I think they're doing a uh, very good job in creating utility scale solar energy. Um, I do support uh, uh, the development of renewable energy. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, in developing, I, I think we can become a little more technically savvy and we can start to develop more vertical structures so we don't take up as much, uh, much of that land. I think we're moving in that direction. And um, I, I uh, applaud Envy Energy for the progress they've made. And I think that distributed generation is going to help uh, to take some of that, uh, that utility scale generation and make it available for selling to other states. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's a, a continuous improvement thing, and I think that each case needs to be studied. The impact on the environment needs to be studied, and uh, the best technical solution needs to be studied. What I don't think we should be doing is engaging in policy which, um, which does not support renewable energy and increases the use of water uh, for uh, energy uh, generation of, of energy. And when I say water, I'm, I'm not talking about hydropower. I'm talking about uh, steam generation, right? So. Okay, so Nevada, either they have, they've already started tracking mileage or they're about to start tracking mileage here in Nevada. Uh, so my question is, do you support the new mileage tax or do you not? Uh, tell me more about that. Um, so there's... So the new mileage tax, I want to say they're going to start charging... Um, maybe 27 cents a mile 13 to 27 cents a mile so would you support uh, uh, nevada doing that or would you be against it i don't support any application which um, allows the uh, the state to track my um, my going uh, going about um, i believe that uh, you know that uh, that where i go is a uh, is is a personal matter and if um, if that's what the application will do I, I wouldn't support that I'm not sure where the uh, how the money would be collected what type of application they would use to, to track the data to track the mileage uh, whether you know my son's mileage would be included with mine or how that all works uh, I'm not very familiar with that policy um, at face value I don't um, I'm not really a fan of uh, additional taxation in in uh, uh, those kind of ways uh, where we are tracking people's personal habits and, and that type of thing. So you said you're not in favor of additional taxation. Um, would you ever be in favor of a simple flat tax rate? End of story. And you said you're a religious man. You believe in mm -hmm. God. If you give God 10 percent, you don't want to turn the government into God. Why does the government deserve more than 10% of what you worked for? Uh, you know, my stepdad is a proponent of, um, yeah, he's uh, actually, a, um, I, thought, I was hoping we'd talk more about the VA. I'm, I'm kind of shepherding him through a VA process right now. He's uh, have some health problems. Uh, but um, a flat tax, he's a, he's a proponent of that. Uh, you know, I don't, um, like I, I think I told you earlier, and, and uh, I am, um, um, I know what I know and know what I don't know, uh, you know, and I'm not a, um, um, a, an expert on the tax system as it exists now. I know that, uh, you know, I, I pay my fair share in taxes, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm hoping and, uh, and as state senator, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to make sure that my taxes are, are put 
um, are used in the most efficient manager to provide ma an efficient manner to provide the uh, most and best services to the community. Uh, flat tax has a, a, some positive implications, some negative implications. I'm just not sure overall uh, what the benefit uh, would be other than simplifying the tax code and 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 you know spreading um, spreading the pain among um, amongst everyone equally. Uh, so. If it would eliminate state taxes, uh, you know, and if, if everyone had a, uh, the same flat tax, it may be something good. But I'd have to know a lot more about that, Mr. Switzer, before I committed to supporting something like that. Okay. The, ne the next one's a two-part question. Are you in favor or against the death penalty? Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting question. You know, as a state senator, um, you know, my focus is on the – um, on the needs of my district and you know that's uh, 128 130,000 people in two assembly districts in the area that we talked about earlier um, death penalty is not something that uh, that I would be dis deciding on uh, or talking about in that position um, I'm in favor of um, the what I'm in favor of is the is the prop the just penalty for the crime that's committed. I'm not in a position to determine whether anyone should die or not die. That, I believe that that's, um, that's uh, God's, it's God's mission. And that uh, if, uh, if societies have to be disciplined and well-regulated. And you know, if you look back in biblical days, they would take people out to the front of the, um, from the community and stone them to death, you know, for minor infractions sometimes. What we, we consider minor infractions. Um, I think that uh, we, we would have to be very, 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 very sure before we um, put someone to death. And I, I believe that in the past we haven't been very, 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 very sure uh, in doing so. And uh, so do I support the death penalty? Um, I, I, I'm not going to... Um, Commit to supporting or not not supporting it. So there are some people that uh, probably have committed heinous crimes and don't deserve to be in our society anymore. Is it better for society to put those people in jail and have them, uh, you know, stay in a, a jail environment for the rest of their lives, locked in a small cell room, um, you know, given the bare minimum sustenance in life, and uh, is that is that more of a punishment than than putting them to death? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So um, it's, that's my answer on the death penalty. Okay, well, just to give you, give you some figures on it, to keep one inmate in prison for a year, $1,800 of taxpayers' money. To do it for 30 years, which is standard murder rate charge, 30, mm -hmm. 25, 30 to life, cost over a half a million dollars to the taxpayers. So the injustice of the fact that the family, whose family member was murdered, is now paying taxes to house, feed, and keep alive the person who took their family member from them mm -hmm. at the tune of over a half a million dollars for 30 years. Those are the numbers. Yes. You know, my family has not been personally impacted by any type of horrific violence like that. So, you know, I could have a... Um, my view on the redemption of man, right, that everyone can be changed, right, everyone can, uh, can be saved, and that, that you know, that, that's my philosophy, because I've never experienced the horrific uh, impact of someone in my uh, family, uh, you know, facing something like that. Uh, my point of view, and my point of view is based on my socialization and my perspective and my experiences, my point of view could be different if that was my family. Um, the money thing, um, half a million dollars in over 30 years, uh, I believe that we incarcerate way too many people anyways, uh, that, uh, you know, they're, that uh, you know we, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. And uh, that, uh, that we need to address uh, who's being incarcerated, why they're being incarcerated. Um, when it comes down to taking someone's life, uh, we need to decide, uh, you know, as a society, society, as a civilized society, what we believe the just and fair punishment for, for their crime is. And, um, and that's going to be an ongoing dialogue. Uh, 
I can't say I don't support um, um, a, a just uh, penalty for someone who's committed a crime. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank you very much, Ronald, for coming in. Okay. Um, now what I would like you to do is if you can just look into the camera and in about five minutes, if you can just please tell the voters why they should vote for you, why you should be elected, and then please give contact information to uh, the voters so that they can get involved in your campaign. Okay, very good. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me for the interview today. Um, I believe that uh, as a state senator, my educational skills, my prior commitment to the community, my involvement in the community, uh, and my communication skills will enable me to work effectively uh, collaborating with my colleagues uh, in the Senate and Assembly to create the best uh, policies uh, that are uh, for, for our community. I decided to run for uh, Senate, uh, State Senate District 18 because I truly believe those skill sets are, are going to uh, be necessary and that I, don't th I don't think right now we have a lot of people with those skill sets. I also think that um, as a veteran, you know, right now only 20% of our congressmen are veterans and that's the lowest amount of veterans uh, representing the people that we've ever seen and uh, it's continuing to, to go down. I believe that we need more people that represent the people that uh, have defended our nation. And uh, I, would, I will be one of those people. Um, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, compassion, generosity, and kindness is the cornerstone of a great society. I also believe that, uh, that uh, you know, to who much is given, much is expected. And, uh, you know, that's a quote from Robert Kennedy. It's not something original for me, but it's also, um, you know, the prime tenant of my life. I've been, I've worked hard. I believe in hard work and discipline. I've worked hard, and uh, I believe that everyone around me should work hard if they have the capabilities to do so. Um, and I believe that uh, if, if, in working hard, uh, this nation, uh, this community, uh, Nevada in particular, has blessed me in many, many ways. And uh, I want to, uh, to give that back to the community, and, um, and I will if, if elected. And I please urge you to vote for me. I am the best selection for state senator. You can reach me at 702-470-8332. Uh, you can email me at ron at billadoforyou.com. And I appreciate the time today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, that now concludes our endorsement panel interview for State Senate District Number 18.